Next on Currents News, the Brooklyn Diocese settles a highly contested case involving four survivors of sexual abuse at the hands of a church volunteer. President Trump gets a first-hand look at the damage in the Carolinas left behind by Hurricane Florence. The woman accusing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault won't go public until there's an FBI investigation. Plus, I talk with one of the nation's foremost Latino Catholic leaders about the Encuentro, which is about to get underway in Texas. The news starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Faubless. The Diocese of Brooklyn has settled litigation with four survivors of sexual abuse. The diocese says the crimes were committed by a church volunteer inside his private apartment between 2003 and 2009. The predator is currently serving a prison sentence. Currents News Michelle Powers is outside the Chancery in Windsor Terrace with details. Four men who were repeatedly sexually abused as minors by a religion teacher at a Roman Catholic church have reached a $27.5 million settlement with the Diocese of Brooklyn. That's one of the largest payouts in the history of the Catholic Church. The sexual abuse came at the hands of a volunteer from this church, St. Lucy's St. Patrick's in the Clinton Hill section of Brooklyn. Angelo Serrano, a religion teacher, was found responsible nearly a decade ago for raping four victims between the ages of 8 and 12 from 2003 to 2009. The Diocese of Brooklyn highly contested its role in the abuse of the adolescents. In a statement, the spokesperson for the diocese, Adriana Rodriguez, said, Mr. Serrano was a volunteer worker at a local parish. He was not clergy or an employee of the diocese or parish. He is currently serving a prison term for his crimes. Serrano was arrested in 2009 and is currently serving a 15-year sentence for his crimes. The Diocese of Brooklyn says the abuse did not take place on church grounds, but in Serrano's private apartment. The Diocese of Brooklyn concluded litigation in which it highly contested its role in the sexual abuse of four adolescents. The diocese and another defendant have settled these lawsuits brought by the four claimants who were sexually abused by Angelo Serrano at his private apartment many years ago. Two priests at St. Lucy's St. Patrick's were named co-defendants in the case. According to published articles, one of those priests says he saw Serrano kiss a minor on the mouth and inappropriately embrace the boy. All of those opposed? The abuse occurred after the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops instituted its charter for the protection of children and young people in 2002, drafted after the devastating revelations that same year of decades of sexual abuse and cover-up in the Archdiocese of Boston. Since then, the U.S. Catholic Church has had a zero-tolerance policy towards priests and lay individuals who have abused minors. However, the current settlement in Brooklyn could lead to scrutiny as to whether a breakdown in the system occurred. The diocese says they are still fully committed to healing. The diocese endeavored to reach this settlement in a way that compensates Mr. Serrano's victims and respects their privacy. We hope this is another step forward in the healing process for these claimants. The diocese remains committed to ensuring that its parishes, schools and youth programs remain safe and secure for the young people who are entrusted to our care. The other defendant, the Dorothy Bennett Mercy Center, is paying a portion of the total settlement. The Diocese of Brooklyn is paying out nearly 17.4 of the 27.5 million in this settlement to the four claimants. Insurance is covering the diocese's portion of the settlement. This payout comes amid a New York State civil investigation in which the Attorney General subpoenaed all eight dioceses in New York. The Brooklyn Diocese vows full cooperation with that investigation. In Windsor Terrace, Michelle Powers, Currents News.
There are a number of very important measures in place to identify and prevent abuse in the Brooklyn Diocese. Under the leadership of Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio, the Office of Victim Assistance has been established to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides many resources, including counseling and referrals for therapy. Also, every employee of the diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. The bishop meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Mass of Hope and Healing in the diocese with Bishop DiMarzio presiding. The diocese also has a toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line, and that number is 888-634-4499. And for more information, go to the Diocese of Brooklyn's website, dioceseofbrooklyn.org, and click on Protecting Our Children. Also in the news, President Trump is getting a first-hand look at the damage left behind by Hurricane Florence on the Carolina coast, where several rivers are at major flood stages. Steve Nannis has that report. Our state took a gut punch. The rain may be gone, but residents in North and South Carolina are still grappling with rising floodwaters and massive storm damage following Hurricane Florence. This event's not over. The rivers are still cresting, and so we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to the life safety and life sustainment mission. Hang in there, okay? Take care of the house. President Donald Trump visited the storm-torn region on Wednesday as water overflows from rivers and creeks rushing downstream to towns and cities. The Cape Fear River is expected to crest at 62 feet on Wednesday. Officials are urging residents to be patient and be ready for the long haul. We will be there 100 percent. All of the folks from the federal government that are around uh, the table, uh, they're, they're confirming it. That's why we started early and uh, we'll, we'll be here late. We're going to be with you, you know that. The challenge now for state and federal officials is providing residents with the resources they need for the thousands of people still in shelters to the tens of thousands of people who were impacted by the storm, which took dozens of lives. We've got a long road ahead in the days and the months uh, uh, and even years ahead. We are a beacon in the south and we have weathered storms before in our state. But Mr. President, we have never seen one like this. Steve Nannis, Currents News. North and South Korea have made a deal that could lead to the end of nuclear weapons on the peninsula. During a joint press conference in Pyongyang, Kim Jong-un pled to shut down all engine testing and missile launching. South Korean President Moon Jae-in called the decision the beginning of, quote, the era of no war. Both sides have pledged to remove all nuclear threats. The Pentagon has a new strategy for dealing with cyber attacks. The U.S. military is being granted more authority to launch preventative cyber strikes in an effort to build a more lethal force against hackers. The Defend Forward initiative allows the U.S. to carry out offensive hacking operations to defend the country from attack. A new obstacle in the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, the woman accusing him of sexual assault decades ago, won't testify in public this Monday after all. John Lawrence has that report. Judge Brett Kavanaugh's vote for the Supreme Court was originally scheduled for Thursday, but now Kavanaugh and his accuser, Christine Blasey Ford, are invited to testify about the incident Monday. However... Any talk of a hearing on Monday, frankly, is premature because... She just came forward with these allegations. Ford's legal team wants the FBI to investigate the allegations before testimony is taken. In a letter to Senate Judiciary Committee Chuck Grassley, Ford's lawyers say their client has received harassment and death threats since coming forward. There must not be a hearing on Monday and then a possible vote on the nominee a day or two after. But the White House says a federal investigation won't help. They don't want to be involved. If they wanted to be, I would certainly uh, do that. But as you know, they say this is not really their thing. Most Republicans still back Kavanaugh, calling the assault claim an accusation which he has unequivocally denied and which stands at odds with every other piece of the overwhelming positive testimony we've re received. Some in the GOP also say Ford should give her side of the story Monday in front of the Judiciary Committee. And I really hope that she doesn't pass up that opportunity. The hearing should be as a result of the investigation. It shouldn't be a substitute for it. John Lawrence, Currents News. 
The U.S. bishops are protesting the Trump administration's new quota, limiting the number of refugees allowed into the country. The cap is set at 30,000, the lowest number ever. In a statement, the bishops call the action, quote, deeply disturbing, and it leaves many human lives in danger. Also, the decision contradicts who we are as a nation. Vatican officials are reportedly heading to China later this month. A Chinese newspaper reported that the delegation will meet with Chinese officials to discuss the final steps before an agreement on the appointment of bishops is signed. Chinese government sources have stressed that the negotiations will stay on the religious level and will not touch on any diplomatic issues at hand. The Vatican is confirming the finances of the Sistine Chapel Choir are under investigation in a move authorized by the Pope. The choir's manager and director are being probed on suspicion of money laundering, fraud and embezzlement. The choir is one of the oldest in the world. There's a lot more news headed your way. I'll talk with an expert who may know more than anyone else about the Encuentro. The Pope has a very full day. He talks to thousands about parents and what should never be done. And he meets with U2 singer Bono. The conversation is very wide ranging. And do you have a story idea, something happening in your parish we should know about? Because we want to hear from you. Keep this email handy, newstips at desalesmedia.org. We'll be right back. Catholics from around the country are heading to Texas for the fifth Encuentro. To talk more about it, the founder of the Board for Catholic Association of Latino Leaders and an expert on the history of the Encuentro, Mario Paredes, and he joins me now. Mario, thank you so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to this conversation because you wrote a book called The History of the National Encuentros, Hispanic Americans in the One Catholic Church. Tell us a little bit more about this history. Uh, well. Uh uh, thank you for the invitation. Delighted to be here. Uh, we began in the early 70s a process to look for integrating Hispanic American in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And it began here in Brooklyn. Oh, everything good Father starts in Brooklyn. Father <laughs> Jack O'Brien, mm -hmm. he was the prime promoter mm -hmm. of the first national encuentro that took place in Washington, D.C. And to that call joined Monsignor Robert Stern from New York Archdiocese mm -hmm. and a number of other directors of Hispanic ministry in the Northeast. From there, now we have the first Encuentro in mm -hmm. 1972. The second Encuentro, we had it in 1977 and the third Encuentro in 1985. And from there on until now, mm -hmm. the fourth Encuentro truly was not a fourth Encuentro. It was a, a national celebration mm -hmm. of the millennium. Now, as you watch uh, the Encuentro progress and move forward, what's the atmosphere like? What are the major changes you've seen from event to event? The first that uh, really called my attention is the greater number of diocesan bishops mm. that are participating in the process and they have committed themselves to attend. The second uh, number that we should point out is the participant is more than 3,000 Hispanic America mm -hmm. going to Texas uh, for deliberations. Uh, and the third element is the amount of international observers mm -hmm. that will be attending uh, the event to follow the conversations of Hispanic American Catholic mm -hmm. in today's church life. Mario, given your expertise uh, with the Hispanic community, with the Encuentro, how would you describe the current landscape of the community, especially now in this climate after the clerical sex abuse crisis? Do you think that's going to be part of the discussions? Uh, I have no doubt that it will be mm -hmm. simply because it's such a, an incredible phenomenon in the life of our church today. But also, I think uh, there are other matters that are as pressing, not as scandalous as they are, but they are painful. 
immigration is an important uh, issue. It's a big cry to have new laws that address the question of the undocumented uh, immigrant. Also, no health care. Mm -hmm. uh, health care is a dramatic situation for the poorest in this country, you know. And unfortunately, you know, our government is continuing to cut in, mm -hmm. in health care rather than to redesign, you know, the providing of better health care. I have a final question for you in the time we have left. When you go to update this book, The History of the National Encuentros, what will be your vision? What will be the, the new Encuentros? What do you want to see? Uh, I dream to see a full integration of Hispanic American in the life of the Catholic Church, where that integration means communion and participation which is really what we need today in our beloved church. And what will be the biggest challenge to that really quickly? Uh, the biggest challenge will be the loss of Hispanic America to other Christian churches. Mm. Uh, so we need to redesign a program of evangelization, mm. a missionary program, and to establish you know, a way of, of disciples of the Lord bringing together the family of God. All right, Mario, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. The Fifth Encuentro officially gets underway tomorrow in Texas. We're going to cover all the sights and sounds and much more right here on Currents News in the tablet and with Travos and on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Today at the Vatican, the Holy Father had a high-profile meeting with U2 singer Bono. Their talks covered a wide range of topics and Melissa Butts reports. Pope Francis met at the Vatican with Bono Vox, the famous U2 singer who took advantage of his European tour to stop in the smallest state in the world. He spoke with the Pope about how to improve the education of the children most in need. Bono has worked for more than 30 years within the philanthropic foundation he co-founded, One. It acts to end extreme poverty for children, and he's traveled to Africa more than once to help. Thus, his gift for the Pope was from this experience. In 1986, yes. at the Ethiopian famine, myself and my wife, Anna, we worked in a feeding station for five weeks, and it broke, broke our heart. The Pope returned the gesture with an olive tree of peace. He said in Buenos Aires, back when he was a priest, it was essential to educate, to instill peace. They affectionately said goodbye, and the Pope asked the singer something that's not very unusual. Later, Bono went to the press room where all the media were waiting for him. He explained his conversation with Pope Francis and said that inevitably the cases of abuse came up. Uh, we also inevitably, having just come from Ireland, we talked about uh, his aghast, his, his, his feeling that he had his, excuse me, we talked about the Pope's um, feelings about what has happened in the church and I, I explained how you know it looks to some people like the, the, the abusers are being uh, more protected than the victims and he, you can see the pain in his face and um, I felt he was sincere and um, I think he's an extraordinary man for extraordinary times. It's not the first time that the singer has met with a pope. In 1999, he had an audience with Pope John Paul II. At the Vatican, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Pope Francis also spent time talking to a much larger crowd today about how to treat parents. The Holy Father complained about one thing he said must never be done. E poi, fra noi c'è l'abitudine di dire cose brutte, anche parolacce, per favore, mai, mai, mai insultare i genitori altrui, mai, mai si insulta la mamma, mai insultare il papà, mai, mai. Fate voi questa decisione interna, di oggi in più mai insulterò la mamma o il papà de qualcuno. No, sono, le hanno dato la vita.
non devono essere insultati. The Holy Father explained that by following the fourth commandment, honor thy father and mother, Catholics can lead happy lives and make peace with the past. Still to come on Currents News, the connection between air pollution and dementia. I'll have the story of the veteran who's lost his best friend and is hoping for her return. We'll be right back. A new study shows that breathing polluted air may be killing your brain. Researchers in London have discovered that people living in the most polluted areas of the city were 40 percent more likely to be diagnosed with dementia. The scientists say that more studies are needed to determine causation, but their findings do corroborate with other studies out of both China and Canada. According to the World Health Organization, dementia is the seventh leading cause of death in the world. A new report from the National Youth Tobacco Survey says one in 11 students in the country have vaped cannabis. The report found that over 12 percent of high schoolers and nearly 5 percent of middle schoolers have used marijuana in an e-cigarette. Dogs have long been known as man's best friend. Well, for one 76-year-old veteran, his dog is even more than that. She's also his service pet, but someone stole the man's car this week and with it, his dog. I was aboard the USS Constellation, CVA-64, Pride of the Seventh. Jack Steinman, a proud Navy veteran, has done and seen a lot in his 76 years. We were in Korea when it was a conflict. I went to Antarctica. Ice crystals bigger than both your hands and more beautiful than a diamond. From his perch on the front steps of his home, he shares memories that span decades, yet he tells a story like it happened yesterday. But this story is one Jack never imagined telling. Why did I ever put her in this kind of harm? Why? Last night, about 9.30, Jack and a friend made a quick trip to a local auto zone to buy brake pads. Jack left his service dog, Ladybug, a two-and-a-half-year-old poodle mix, in his locked car, engine running, air conditioner on. They were gone a few minutes, just enough time for someone to steal Jack's car and Ladybug. Jack doesn't care about the car, but Ladybug, trained with voice and hand signals, is special. He needs his best friend to come home. I don't have nobody else. Wife's gone, boys got families of their own back in Oklahoma. Jack is hoping whoever has her sees this story and brings her back. His heartfelt plea? Please bring her home, but don't be mean to her. Please just bring her home or let me know. I'll come and get her or whatever, but don't be mean to her. Oh, Jack says he believes whoever stole his car was watching the parking lot just waiting for someone to rob, but I hope that person does the right thing. This 10-year-old boy in California shares his name with Superman, but he could be the next Michael Phelps. This summer, Clark Kent Aquata broke the 100-meter butterfly record that Phelps set when he was the same age. And Monterey County officially declared September 18th Superman Clark Kent Aquata Day. I feel, I feel great, I feel amazing. <laughs> Trying to get the national age group records. And yeah, my ultimate goal is to make it to the Olympics. Uh, Clark beat Michael Phelps' record by more than a second. Good for him. That is Currents News. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Liz Fobles. Set your DVR to record this program so that you never miss it because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.